It is really good to be here today and to see all of you here and to have this opportunity to worship together and see folks be obedient to the Lord and get baptized and uh, just do uh, everything that God has told us to do. It's quite incredible to be where God wants you to be doing what he wants you to do. And so today we're going to continue our, our series of lessons about relevant issues. All year, from the first Sunday in January until today, we have been talking about relevant issues, things that, that the Lord has shown me are things that people face every day in the normal routine of life. It's not the kind of stuff you just talk about at the church house and go home and forget it. We're talking about stuff that is right where the rubber meets the road. It's right there where we live every day. And we tried to talk about relevant issues. Last week, we talked about how to be sure you marry the right person. And I gave you some statistics about uh, marriage and divorce and remarriage and all that kind of stuff. And, and after the service, three or four of you came to me and said, those statistics are kind of depressing. And I think that's true. I think those of you who were here last week, that is depressing, isn't it? But it just affects us every day that we live. And so we looked at that um, last week and how that we can be sure that we marry the right person if we're not married married right now. And if we are married, I told you that is the right person because God hates divorce. So he doesn't want you to dump that person in pursuit of somebody else. But I, I tell you this, I tell you this, we got kids, teenagers that aren't married yet. And they're playing the dating game. And last week we learned about the dating game, didn't we? It ain't God's way to find the right person, and we talked about that. And if you weren't here last week, get on Facebook and look at the, at the stuff that we saw from Scripture last week. And so today, we're going to assume that you've married the right person, and now we're going to talk about how to be married for a lifetime. Too many marriages crumble. Those statistics last week said that 42% 40 of marriages in the United States fail. 42% of people who get married get divorced. That's a pretty staggering statistic, right? And I explained to you that back in, uh, in the 1990s, the, the rate was 50%. And so you say, well, we're doing better. We're 8% better. But then I pointed out to you, don't get too excited. The reason we're doing better is because more and more and more people cohabitate rather than get married. And so when they bust up, it doesn't show up in the statistics. The statistics would be even higher if we counted all of that. And so it's kind of depressing. But we're going to talk about today what God says we can do to be married for a lifetime. We're going to start with Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 31. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 31. These verses, um, if, if, if you don't have a Bible with you, they're going to be on the screen. They're also printed in your bulletin. If you can't get to the right part of your bifocals on the screen, they're printed in your bulletin. And so we're going to be looking at these. Paul wrote this to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 31. He said, for this reason... A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Paul was actually quoting from Genesis chapter 2, verse number 24. And when he quoted that and, and, and wrote it down in this letter to the Ephesians and then added some commentary to it, he gave us a wonderful definition of marriage. Let's look at it again. It's in Ephesians 5.31. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they too will become one flesh. Those two words, one flesh, describe a deeply intimate and passionate marriage relationship expressed physically, emotionally, and spiritually. This is the kind of marriage that God wants you and your spouse to have. It's the kind of marriage God wants every couple to have. And I want to tell you, no matter where your marriage is right now, you can change it by the grace of God into this kind of marriage. Marriages that last a lifetime are built on three essential pillars, three essential supports, three mechanisms that are designed by God to help your marriage last a lifetime. And what we're going to do today is we're going to briefly examine each one of these three essential pillars that support a marriage that will last a lifetime. The first one is God himself. He's the first pillar. You need to begin right now, improving and strengthening <coughs> your relationship with God. Because I'm just here to tell you that if your relationship with God is not right, there is no other relationship in your life that will be right. Do you understand that? 
He is the supreme one. He is the first one. If you can't get that relationship right, then all of your other relationships are going to suffer. So you need to concentrate on that one. The words that John the Baptist said must become your personal motto. John chapter 3, verse number 30. This is what he said about Jesus. John said, he must become greater, I must become less. He must increase, I must decrease. He's got to become more important than I am. Do you know why some people make such stupid decisions in life that affect not only themselves, but people they're in relationship with? It's because they are the center of their own universe. They are the most important one. And they make all their decisions based on what they think is best for them regardless of anybody else. Listen, I want to tell you, when you get off the throne of your life and you put God on the throne of your life and He becomes the most important one and that relationship becomes the most important one, your decision-making mechanism will change. And when that changes, it will change the way you affect all of the people that are around you. And so we got to get that. we got to understand that. That has the most important, important relationship. Your focus must be more on what God wants and less on what you want. Successfully learning to develop a marriage that will last a lifetime depends to a large degree on your spirituality. That is how close each of you is to the Lord. And it depends on how close each of you are as a couple to the Lord. Do you get that? You, you, know, you need to both be on the same page. You need to both be going in the same direction. That's why in that verse we looked at last week that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said, do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. If they're going in one direction and you're going in another direction, you, you, you got a problem right off the beginning. You need to pray. You say, well, I'm already married. And you know, we got married and we were both heathens. How many, can we take a survey? How many of you say we got married and we were both heathens at the time? And you say, God saved me, but God didn't save them. They don't want anything to do with God. What I do now, what you do now is you begin to pray for that person. You begin to pray for your spouse harder than you pray about anything else because the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman accomplishes much. If you want them to change and get going in the direction that you're going because you want to follow Jesus and they don't, pray, pray, and pray some more. Do you get that? That's the plan. Don't dump them and find somebody else. That's not God's plan. He says, I hate divorce. You pray and you pray and you pray some more. So God is the, is the first essential pillar. King David, King David wrote this. Psalm 127, verse number one. Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Do you know what that means? When he talks about the house, he's not talking about a structure made of wood and stone. He's talking about the, the household, the, the, the community of people that live in that house. That was the way they used that word house in the Old Testament. And so you see, if the Lord is building your relationship with your spouse, and because of that, building the relationship with your children, and building the relationship with other people around you, if the Lord is building that, man, there is success because he never fails. But if he's not building it and you're trying to build it, your chances of success are slim to none. Do you get that? Because the laborers, their builders are laboring in vain. Do you know what that word in vain means? Pointlessly. With no, to no benefit. And I want to tell you, there's a lot in that. A lot of people don't value marriage because they don't understand God's real plan for marriage. I ask people sometimes, what do you think God designed this whole thing about marriage about? What, what's this all about anyway? And people will say things like companionship. No. He didn't just design it for companionship. And then if it's a guy, he'll say sex. He didn't just design it for sex. You know what God designed a marriage for? Because when he created man, he knew that man wasn't going to be able to do everything that he needed to be able to do for him. 
And so he waited a little while and watched Adam flounder around and not be able to do everything very well, like naming the animals and taking care of the garden and all that. And then God decided it's not good for this guy to be alone. He's never going to make it. That really puffs us up, doesn't it, guys? And then so he decided to make a suitable helper for him. A suitable helper. A helper who could help him do what God had designed him to do. You see, the whole purpose of God in marriage is so that he can unite one man and one woman and together they could do what neither one of them could do alone for him. Do you get that? And so your ministry for God as a couple has got to be the center of your marriage. So that means if you're looking for somebody to marry, you need to be looking that person over and saying, this is what God has put me here to do. Can they help me do that? If you're a guy, if you're a girl, you need to be saying, God put me here to help some idiot do what he can't do. (laughs) Now, am I the girl that's cut out for that? And you say, you know, I like this guy. I'm attracted to him. He's really hot, and I really would like to be with him. But... He has no idea what he's been put here for. He doesn't know his purpose in life. He ain't a guy. At least not right now. Because if you marry him and he don't know what in the world he's here for, and you're supposed to help him do that, you're going to have no idea how to help him do what he don't know he's supposed to do. And you're going to be a frustrated woman. How many of you girls have ever been a frustrated woman? Oh, my word. How many of you guys have ever been married to a frustrated woman? <laughs> How'd that work out for you? That's not real good, is it? That's not real good at all. You see, the guy's got to know his purpose in life, and the girl then has to determine, am I the girl that's designed to help him do that? you got to know that. And pity these poor girls that marry some guy, and, and then later on he finds out his purpose in life. And she says, there ain't no way I'm cut out to do that. I mean, he all of a sudden gets saved and starts walking with Jesus, and God calls him to be a missionary to the Aborigines back on the backside of Australia, and they're going to live in a stick hut out in the dirt. And she don't even want to nick one of her nails. We got a problem here, don't we? So you see, it's important that we understand that God has got to be the first one and that what we're supposed to do for God has got to be the most important part of our marriage relationship. Can I tell you a little story about me and Miss Jenny? And you know by now, most of you know us long enough by now to know that we're a little weird. Here's what happened. Here's what happened. Somehow God showed her this when she was in kindergarten. She was riding home from the bus one day, on the bus one day from kindergarten, riding home. And, and her, her parents had started taking those kids to church, and she really liked church. And if you know Miss Jenny very well, she really likes people. And so when she got to go to church, wow, she got to be around people. And she liked that as a little girl. And so she's riding home one day on the bus from kindergarten, and she looked out in the window, and she looked up to the sky, and she said, God, let me marry a preacher so he'll always take me to church. In kindergarten, she said that. She prayed that prayer. So all through high school, when everybody was dating, she wasn't dating. She looked around at the boys in the high school our age, and she said, no, not a preacher in a bunch. (laughs) You know? And then between between our sophomore and junior year in high school, I got saved. And then... The Lord, just a few weeks later, called me into pastoral ministry and just showed me this is what you're supposed to do. And so I came back to school, a bona fide preacher. And she looked at me and she said, hmm, this might be the one. And then we graduated from high school. And about a year later, we were married. And our whole life, it has been all about she's supposed to be a preacher's wife and I'm supposed to be a preacher. And it's just been what God wanted. Do you understand that? And it wasn't because she really understood all this that I'm telling you and that I understood all this that I'm telling you because, listen, you know, as a young man, I was a, a worse idiot than I am now. And I didn't get all this, but God in his mercy, you know, just kind of worked that out in our lives. And then when we can look back on it, we say, wow, here it is in the scripture, exactly what God 
did for us as we stumbled through our young adult life. And so, you know, unless the Lord builds the house, it's builders labor in vain. Jesus said this in John 15, 5. He said, I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You know, if you're trying to do life yourself, you'll fall on your face every time. But if you're trying to do life with Jesus, if you're trying to do life the way he wants you to because he wants you to do it this way, then he'll step in there and he will be that third cord. You know what I mean by that? In the Old Testament, the scripture says that a threefold cord is not easily broken. They've done some research on this and they have discovered that if you take two cords and wind them together, you strengthen the the, the fibers in that, it, it's more difficult to break. But it's not even quite double. It's like 40-some percent increased strength when you wrap two together. But you know what happens when you wrap three together? It's like 150-some percent increase in the strength. Three-fold cord. You know why I think God designed physics that way? To teach us a spiritual lesson that in a marriage, if you want the strongest possible marriage, it can't be just you and your spouse. It's got to be you and your spouse and God. Get that? Three-fold cord. And so we got to get that. He has got to be central in the thing. King David, King David was just so right when he said, unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. I think it's all pretty clear. Any endeavor attempted on your own will fail. Any endeavor attempted with God, an endeavor that honors him, will succeed, including building a great marriage. Now, before you panic, let me assure you, that you don't have to be a spiritual giant to enrich your marriage. All you need is a little faith. Just a little faith goes a long ways. The more faith you got, the better. But a little faith goes a long way. Jesus described the awesome power of a tiny amount of faith when he said this in Matthew 17, 20. He said, I tell you the truth. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible to you. So it is not impossible for God to restore your marriage. I don't care how broken it is. Do you get that? As long as the two of you are still living and one of you hasn't married somebody else, God can restore that marriage. He can do that. Because that's what he says he can do. Nothing will be impossible for you if you just have a little bit of faith. A mustard seed is incredibly small. And all God asks is that you do what he says to do to develop at least some mustard seed-sized faith. The, the, the spiritual key to developing faith is being exposed to God's word. I hear people all the time say, Oh, God, give me more faith. And I chuckle under my breath. Because they somehow think that praying is God's key to more faith. Nowhere in the book does it say that. It doesn't say that praying and begging God for more faith will give it to you. You know what the key to getting more faith is? If you start with that little mustard seed of faith, you know what the key to getting more faith is? Exposure to the Word of God. It's hearing the Word of God. That's what Paul wrote in Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You get faith, you get additional faith by exposure to the Word of God. Exposure to God's Word can be achieved in two ways. There's two different ways you can get this, and I think God wants you to get it in both ways. The first is personal study. Oh, unfortunately, the church is woefully lacking in personal Bible study today. Personal study where you open up the book and say, I'm going to learn something that's from this book today. Paul wrote this to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So, so if you want exposure to the Word of God more consistently than you can get it any other way, you open the Word regularly and just study. You know what study is? Study is learning the key facts. I mean, if you're in high school and you're about to take a history test and you're going to study for that exam, what are you doing? Aren't you trying to learn the key facts? The most important, valuable material you can learn right now from that section of the history book so you can pass the test? So you see, study means look at your life 
See where your weaknesses are. See what your problems are. See what your challenges are. And search out meaningful passages of Scripture that deal with that. Do you get it? Deal with that. And so that's what he says. He says that we need to study. That's personal exposure to the Word of God. That will grow your faith. And the second, the second method of exposure to the Word of God that I think is also critically important is regularly meeting with a local church where the Word of God is preached. I'm not talking about a three points and a poem kind of church. I'm talking about a church that will dig into the Word of God and lay it out for you in a relevant way where you can understand it and comprehend it and take it home and do something with it this week. I'm talking about a church that is, is not afraid to just expose you to the Word of God even when you don't want to be exposed to it. Right? Even when you leave saying, I feel a little bit bruised and, and a little bit abrased today. I know you never feel that way after I preach, but you could. The author of the book of Hebrews wrote this. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Isn't that what the word of God does to us? Spurs us on to love and good deeds. Then look at the very next thing he says. Not giving up meeting together. You know what that means? Just don't quit meeting with the church. We need one another. And every time we come here, we ought to be on mission to help somebody with some issue they're struggling with. And in order to help them, we need to have some scripture in our heart. So when that young lady comes to you and says, oh, my kids are driving me nuts, you can give them scripture. Give her some scripture. You know the scripture most of them need to hear? Praise God, Miss Phyllis. That's the one I was going to say. Spare the rod and spoil the child. And I usually say it like this. I quote that scripture and I say, when that child's throwing a fit, take them into the ladies' room and wear them out. Amen. You say, I'll get arrested. Don't leave any marks on them, but wear them out. <laughs> Do you understand that? That's the responsibility of a parent. We need to have some scripture. Some scripture ready to give one another because we're supposed to spur one another on to love and good deeds. But don't quit, he says. Don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. <laughs> you see, non-church attendance was a problem way back here in the, in the, when the New Testament book of Hebrews was written. It's nothing new. But encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. You see, I can't stress enough the importance of regular exposure to God's Word. It has the potential to become a powerful force in your life and in your marriage. The author of the book of Hebrews also wrote this, The Word of God is living and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Get that? Living and powerful. So that's number one. First pillar is God. Second pillar now, we usually don't like this one, especially when we're younger. It's accountability. Most of you or some of you know what accountability is. All of you folks at Freedom House, you know what accountability is, right? That means somebody is always watching. That's what accountability means, right? That's the second pillar that supports a strong marriage that lasts a lifetime. It's accountability. You and your spouse each need to find a person who will serve as an accountability partner for you. It's no accident that every time Jesus wanted something significant accomplished, he sent two people to get the job done. He never sent one person alone. In fact, when he had a man and he was the only man around, he looked at that man and said he's an idiot. It is not good for him to be alone. You get that? We tend to get in trouble when we're alone. We always need to have somebody there to hold us accountable. And so, here's an example. Um, it's in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, verses, or excuse me, Mark, verse 6 and, and, and 7, chapter 6, verse 6 and 7. This is what Mark wrote. Jesus went around teaching from village to village. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two. Why do you think he sent them out two by two? They needed accountability. Listen, you work harder if somebody's watching. You work more consistently if somebody's watching. You tend to stay out of trouble if somebody's watching. You get that? 
That's just accountability. And Jesus sent these guys out two by two, and he gave them authority over impure spirits. God knows that everyone needs to be accountable to someone. King Solomon explained the importance of having a, an accountability partner when he wrote this. It's in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 to 12. He wrote, two are better than one. Who would have thought? Not good for the man to be alone. I'm going to make him a helper. Why? Two are better than one. And then he says it here through the pen of Solomon in the Ecclesiastes. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. What's he saying there? Two are better than one. So we need an accountability partner. An accountability partner partner. You know, this is not a political ad. Don't take it as that. But Vice President Mike Pence, early on in the Trump administration, and it really doesn't make me any difference what you think about the Trump administration. I'm just making a point about Mike Pence and something that happened. Early on in the administration, all of these reporters wanted to, of course, interview everybody in the administration. And some female reporters wanted to um, go out to dinner with Vice President Pence and interview him. And you know what he said? Anybody remember what he said? I never go anywhere with a woman unless my wife is present. And the liberal media ate his lunch. Any of you remember that? They talked about him being anti-women and bashing women. and all that. The man wasn't saying anything bad about women. The man was saying, I don't trust myself. I need to be accountable. I want my wife there if I'm going to be with another woman. Listen, that is not a bad policy. You get that? But the world doesn't understand that. And so two are better than one. We've got to understand that. Your accountability partner should be of the same gender as you with a strong, stable, healthy marriage. I mean, how are they going to keep your strong and healthy and stable or help you get there if theirs isn't? And so that's what it needs to be somebody like that. He or she should be an I've got your back kind of friend who's willing to take the time to meet with you face to face on a regular basis to, quest, or a regular basis to question you about how you're doing at building that marriage that lasts a lifetime. Because do you realize that good marriages don't just happen? Good marriages are the result of working at building a good marriage God's way. And it's hard work. How many of you, how many of you been in here been married more than 30 years? Anybody? Some of you have. You were married more than 30 years. Okay. Let me give you this. Has that been easy? Was that easy? No, it's not easy. There, I, I, can I tell you this? There are no marriages made in heaven. Every one of them are made right here on earth. And this place is messed up. And so without some hard work, our marriages will be messed up as well. It's hard work to have a good marriage, and we need an accountability partner to call us into question and say, are you working on this? Are you working on this? So here's his job description. Let me give you, this is, a, this is my, my view of the job description of an accountability partner. And I think it's based on Scripture. First of all, it needs to be someone that loves Jesus. Because listen, if they don't love Jesus, they won't love you the way they ought to. First, they need to love Jesus, and then they need to love you. You need to be sure that they love you. And then they need to pray for you. If they're not a praying person, that's kind of a strike against them. Because what's going to be the most important thing they can do for you other than love you and love Jesus is to pray for you. And so they need to do that. They, they need to confront you without hesitation or reservation. Get that? They need to love you so much that they're willing to tell you the ugly truth about you even when you don't want to hear it. Don't we need somebody like that in our lives? Do we like that? No, but we need that. And then they, they need to be somebody who will comfort you when it's needed. After they slash you to ribbons, then they need to be able to say, I love you, I'm so sorry I had to tell you that and try to comfort you. Okay, and then they need to encourage you often. Don't we need encouragement often? Don't we tend to get down and depressed and uh, we need encouraged often? And then, here's a real important one, they need to listen to you without judging. Get that? They need to listen to you 
without judging. Now, judging meaning the kind of judgment that we're not supposed to do in Scripture is, is giving punishment, passing down a sentence. Only God can judge that way. Sometimes when we simply evaluate people, they say, you're judging me. You know, I pick up somebody on the highway because, you know, I pick up a hitchhiker so I can tell them the Jesus story. And I pick up an obvious meth head on the highway. And, and sometimes, you know, demons are chasing him and he's coming down and he's in bad shape. And I pick him up and I get him in the car and I try to tell him the Jesus story. And, and in the process of telling him, convincing him that he's a sinner, I said, you know, it's obvious you're a sinner. You're coming down off a of meth high right now. You're judging me. No, I'm just, calling, I'm just telling you the truth. You get that? There's a difference between evaluating so you can help somebody and give them what they need and judging them. I'm not punishing the guy. I picked him up and gave him a ride so I could tell him the Jesus story. I'm not punishing him. I'm not passing any kind of sentence on him. But I must make an evaluation to determine how I can best help him. Sometimes that means confrontation. How many of you can say, thank God that so-and-so in my life confronted me when I needed it or I might not be where I am today? Yeah. But we need that. We need that. So th that's the job description. So here's what I want to encourage you to do. Start praying right now about who your accountability partner should be. Because it's important you get the right person. Be sure to ask God for the right person. James wrote, you do not have because you do not ask God. So if you want the right person, you need to be asking God who it ought to be. And, and when you think you have identified the right person, then crank up your courage and simply ask that person to minister to you by holding you accountable for building a marriage that will last a lifetime. Get that. It's important that we do that. Now, we're going to talk about the last one. It's communication. Communication. Many marriages fail because they don't talk. I see this all the time. I want to confess. Confession is good for the soul. I want to confess. Miss Jenny and I go out to eat way more often than we should. You say, well, that's obvious. We do. We go out to eat way more often than we should. Our kids are out of the house. We got, you know, we got the ability to do that. So we go out and eat way more than we should. And, and we people watch. Any of you people watch? People are the most hilarious human beings. <laughs> I'm telling you. And so we people watch. And we go into the restaurant and we sit down and... And we, we get to looking around, and there'll be multiple couples in the restaurant that never make eye contact during the whole meal because they're staring at their cell phones. You know, and then they get a bite or two, and then back and get a bite or two, and scrolling and put. There's no communication. And then they say, we went on a date. I said, no, you didn't. You sat at the same table and talked to everybody in the world except the person that you're out with. No communication. And communication is crucial. It's, the, it's, it's the, the third pillar that supports a marriage that lasts a lifetime. It's meaningful. I get this. Positive communication. Meaningful, positive communication. Every couple should engage in a minimum of an hour of uninterrupted, one-on-one, -on -one positive communication at least four days out of the week. That's a minimum. You need to chunk out an hour of time and say, this is just our time. We're going to talk. We're going to talk about whatever the other one wants to talk about. We're going to do that for at least an hour, and we need to do that at least four days a week. You can't build much of a relationship if you don't have that much of a minimum communication. Let me give you this. Back when you were courting, how often did you talk? Every time you got the chance. Isn't that true? Every time you got the chance, you pick up a teenager that's dating some girl or some guy. You pick up their cell phone and you go back and look at the number of texts. And you know what you'll find? Multiple hundreds, sometimes in a day. Because they are communicating. Too bad they don't keep doing that after they get married, right? I'm telling you. And you say, well, I wouldn't dare invade my child's privacy by looking at those texts, wake up. If you're a parent, you need to be monitoring that stuff. Wake up. And I know we got teenagers in the room that don't like this. Too bad, guys. Put your plugs in your ears. Parents, wake up. Monitor that stuff. 
for the sake of your teenager. Okay, so communication is important. It's important. I want to tell you this too. You won't need to schedule negative communication. <laughs> that will just happen, right? You don't need to schedule that. It'll happen in spite of all you can do to stop it. You will, however, need to work hard at scheduling times for positive communication. Time together is the foundation of every intimate relationship. Time does not guarantee intimacy, but it is absolutely necessary for intimacy to be created. And during that time, you need to be communicating. The Old Testament book entitled The Song of Solomon is a marvelous illustration of the benefits of meaningful, positive communication between a husband and a wife. Now, can I, I want to say this about the Song of Solomon. It is inspired by God, but much of it is X-rated. If you just read it, just read through it. It's an expression of communication, intimate communication, private communication between a husband and a wife. And I think God put it in there because he wanted to show us how important the, the positive communication between a husband and a wife is in building a marriage. And so we got to get that. It's, it's just crucial. And the Song of Solomon gives us this wonderful example. In the song, Solomon said this to his bride. How beautiful you are, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. That's positive, right? Ladies, wouldn't you like to hear him say something equivalent to that occasionally? He did it. And he does it over and over and over and over and over and over again throughout the book. You get that? I was talking to a guy one time, doing a little marriage counseling, talking to this guy. He was a rough kind of guy. And his wife was just broken and bleeding because she didn't, she didn't think he loved her. Because she needed him to say repeatedly, I love you. I love you. I love you. And I was telling this guy, listen, she needs to hear you say that. I do love her. I said, it doesn't matter. You got to convince her that you love her. And you do that by telling her often that you love her. And he said, I've already told her she ought to know. I said, you are an idiot. Tell her again and again and again. Get it? I learned this as a young man. I learned it the hard way because I'm an idiot too. I learned it the hard way. This shouldn't be all frustrated, all, uh, you know, especially around that time of the month. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, she'd just be all, oh, I'd say, what is wrong? And she'd say, you don't love me. I said, I do. I do. You didn't tell me this morning. <laughs> you know what I learned from that? It took several months. You know what I learned from that? I just tell her that dozens of times every day. I do. I walk by and I'm irritated because of something she said or did. And I'll say, I love you. And I'll just keep on doing it. <laughs> you get that? I'm talking about positive communication. Now, every woman is different. Every woman is different. You've got to figure out what your woman needs to be told and tell her. Tell her. Now, this is not in the notes, but I'm going to give you this. Can I give you this, too? <laughs> you got to do things for her that you don't like to do. Get that? Because is this all about you? No, it's about you, too. And as far as you're concerned, it's about her. And if she's smart, as far as she's concerned, it'll be about you. But you got to do stuff with her that you don't necessarily like to do. Okay? I grew up in a family... My mother can vouch for this. We were not very relational. I mean, we weren't telling each other we loved each other. Now, we do that now, but we had to learn to do it later as adults. We just didn't do that a lot when we were at home. There was not a lot of, of display of affection in our home. You know, it was more stoic and it, it just wasn't there. I, I want to give you this. Then I marry Miss Jenny and her family is just dripping with that stuff. <laughs> and you know, I think God has a sense of humor. I think he does that. I mean, her family is just hugging and kissing and I love you and, uh, 
You know, and it was just all that. And I never had any of that. And so I get married, and I'm not doing that. And she's needing that. And we had a big fight one day. I called it a Mount St. Jenny's eruption. We had one of those. <laughs> and, and we had this big fight. And she said, you don't love me. And I said, I do. I've been telling you, because you know, I'd already learned that. I've been telling you. And she said, you don't even hold my hand. <laughs> Guess what we do now? We hold hands. We're walking across the Walmart parking lot. I'm holding her hand. <laughs> you know that? And people look. People look. And they'll watch us. And sometimes if they're a little older, you know, up around our age, they'll say, that is so cool that you guys are still holding hands. And I'm just holding her hand and I'm thinking, <laughs> I had to learn this, buddy. You get that? You got to do something for them that they need. Even if you're uncomfortable. And I have to tell you, the first time I was holding her hand, walking out in the public, I'm thinking, oh, this is so embarrassing because we never did that. No. Now, now I'm kind of conditioned. Do what? Yeah, and that's what she needed. And so now, without even thinking about it, when I get out the car, my hand goes out like this, even if she's not with me. It's just what you got to do. She will probably watch the video, you think? Oh. So she says that. She says, how beautiful. He says that to her. How beautiful, my darling. Oh, how beautiful. And then his bride replied. She just needs to be two ways. Can't all go one way. The, the, the bride replied, how handsome you are, my beloved. Oh, how charming. You know what most men need, girls? They need to be admired. Amen. They really do. I, I, most men need that. They need to be admired. And that, isn't that what she's doing here? She could have been lying. I never saw Solomon, but she told him what he needed to hear. You know, if Miss Jenny told me how handsome and how charming, I would say, you need your glasses fixed. You know, but she, she says nice things about me. You know, and we need that. Meaningful, positive communication created such a strong bond between Solomon and his bride that this is what she said. My beloved is mine and I am his. What was she talking about? We're together in this for the long haul. He's mine and I am his. And that's the kind of mutual devotion that creates a marriage that lasts a lifetime. I want to give you one more thing about communication and then we're going to do the conclusion. But I need to give you one more thing about communication. There are some things that you never, ever, ever, ever talk about. One in particular. You never talk about divorce. Before we got married, and we, didn't, we weren't as hopefully as knowledgeable in the word as we are today, but before we got married, we just said... To each other because we were in this for ministry we're in this for what we can do for God together and we knew if we got a divorce that would be greatly diminished and so we said before we ever got married we will never have a conversation about divorce it is not an option it will not be placed on the table it will never even be talked about and 42 and almost 42 years later that conversation has never happened I want to tell you something the reason we don't talk about it, it's just pretty simple. You have to talk about it to do it. You don't talk about it, you can't do it. You get that? So you just don't even talk about it. That's just off the table. We don't even discuss it. It's not an option. You get that? You know, and, we, and another one we don't ever talk about is leaving. It's just not an option. We just don't talk about it. Get that? I'll tell you a funny story and then we'll do the conclusion. We had this pizza restaurant. Of course, we had to work till late at night and we closed up, you know, nine o'clock one night and it's 9.30, quarter to 10 before, you know, we're all done and our two boys were teenagers and they worked with us. And, and so, you know, we, we started home and, and we had two vehicles there and, <clears throat> and uh, Miss Jenny got in a vehicle just a couple of minutes before us and she was going to head to the house and me and the boys got in the other vehicle and we were following her to the house and, and we got to the place where she should have turned left. And she didn't. 
And I looked at the boys and I said, she can leave if she wants to, but I'm going with her. What about you guys? And they said, let's go, Dad. <laughs> and she went to the gas station. <laughs> it was just not an option, you know? And that, and that was our philosophy. You can leave if you want to, but if you leave, I'm going, you know? Why? Because it's designed to last a lifetime. A lifetime. So here's the conclusion. God's plan God's plan for every marriage is to be a marriage that lasts a lifetime. Jesus, Jesus answered a question asked by the Pharisees about divorce. And when he answered it, he quoted this same verse that Paul quoted back there in the book of Ephesians. And then, and then he offered some additional commentary. You know, Jesus can do that, right? He can offer additional commentary, and he did. And in his commentary, he stressed God's plan for the permanence of marriage. This is the story. It's in Matthew 19, verses 3 through 6. Some Pharisees came to him, that is, they came to Jesus to test him. And they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? What a dumb question. But that's what they asked him because they were trying to trip him up. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made the male and female, and he said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they too will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. He quoted from the Old Testament there, didn't he? And then look what he said. He's going to answer their question. Therefore... What God has joined together, let no one separate. Now, isn't that pretty clear? When, when, when they got married and they came together in intimacy the first time, God made them one flesh. They are one as far as God is concerned. And Jesus said, now, if God made them one, who are you to tear them apart? Isn't that what he says? When God makes them one, God intends for them to be one from now on. It's the until death do you part kind of deal in the ceremony. And so he says, therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. What does that tell us about marriage from God's vantage point? Stay together. <coughs> Through thick or thin, stay together. And you say, well, I've already blown it. Repent. Just Repent. Take responsibility for whatever you did to cause the separation of you from your spouse. Just repent. Take personal responsibility for that. You can't take personal responsibility for what somebody else did, but you can take personal responsibility for what you did to cause it. Ask God to forgive you. And here's the good news. He will. 1 John 1, 9. He says that if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and do what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You can start all over with a clean slate. Okay? You can start all over the clean slate. And that's what we need to do. Just repent. And, and then if God brings somebody else into your life and you choose to marry them, just remember the lessons you learned the first time. Because if you don't, if you haven't fully repented of that and you, and you haven't begun to change that, guess what will happen? That same stuff will destroy the next one. You get that? And then if that one falls apart and you get married again and you still haven't learned those lessons and corrected that, then what? It'll just continue to happen over and over and over again. And that's not God's plan for you. God has something far better for you than that.